So why art, why theater? Ultimately, I believe that artists can be soul healers. We can explore society's wounds and help to find ways to bring about healing and dialogue. I believe this to be true, and so that's why I'm standing here intellectually naked in front of you. Emotional nakedness is what drives good, interesting theater. Emo emotional na nakedness is what drives good, interesting writing. Emotional nakedness is what drives good, interesting art. But more specifically, I'm going to get personal. Why am I a storyteller, a myth maker? Why do I write plays? I've always viewed myself as an outsider. I wore a big afro through the 80s, five years after it went out of style, and 10 years before it came back into style. <coughs> I write plays about dangerous things such as love and optimism, bucking the trend toward darker, misanthropic themes. So much of my artistic journey has been defined by my struggle to be heard. It's been really interesting to recalibrate my creative process once suddenly people are listening. But as a playwright, we dwell someplace between grandiosity and despair. From the moment we cast our line into this business, we're told that we're never going to make a living. We're told that art is a luxury. We're told that playwriting is a dying art form, and it's going to be a, a hard, unforgiving life. And honestly, these warnings proved to be very true for many, many years. What I like to call my ramen noodle years when I was 20 pounds thinner, and I felt as if I was standing on a soapbox talking to an indifferent passerby. But thankfully, there's that irrational, grandiose part of self that drew me to this insane business, that turned me into a compulsive, passionate creature, compelled to tell stories that challenge and amuse audiences. It's the part of me that is driven to make sense of the chaos that has become our world, and that's liberated by the characters who do speak more lyrically, emphatically, and bolder than I ever dare could. Their voices embolden me to wield language like acupuncture needles carefully placed to keep the nerve endings alive and sensitive. So why write plays? <coughs> why am I writing instead of crunching numbers or sort of feeding folks in the Sudan? I grew up in New York City in the aftermath of the Civil Rights Movement, on the heels of the Black Power Movement. My parents were social activists in the civil servants' drag. My parents' anger and optimism were partnered in creative and forceful ways. They educated me through the arts and taught me to love my culture by exposing me to writers and performing artists and visual artists who were driven to create dynamic and creative work about the African-American experience. And as such, I was raised to be proud and unapologetic. And I'm part of what I call the Nexus Generation, and that's one generation that straddles worlds that's equally informed by blues and hip-hop. And as a member of this Nexus Generation, I embrace the rich blues tradition of my past, but there's part of me that's happy to let those soulful laments of my ancestors go, to shed their pain-tinged songs for a new aesthetic that embraces the complex wordplay and self-celebration of the blues, but is assertive and irreverent and urban and contemporary and fast-paced and braggadocia. It's hip-hop. Hip-hop allows its artists to, be un to unabashedly borrow and reinterpret and build upon the pre-existing. It at once comments on the past while breaking new ground. I love that it has feet in several worlds and it's constantly redefining itself. It's like mythology. It's helping the culture define itself through metaphor. I remember the very first time that I heard hip hop. I was standing in a schoolyard packed with teenagers. It was this unforgivably hot summer day in Brooklyn, one of those spontaneous street parties of the late 1970s. A DJ was at work um, and he'd worked the crowd into a frenzy. The pulsating backbeat was familiar, but the rhymes were entirely fresh and inventive. I didn't know where this DJ was going to take the crowd, but what we experienced um, felt different and vital and dangerous. The old and the new were intermingled, bringing together unexpected ingredients and thus creating something that was so thoroughly modern at the moment we didn't have a word for it. But I direct breath only by way of saying that I'm part of this nexus generation. I'm not only interested in a conversation between the past and the present, but I'm also interested in a conversation between my Afrocentric upbringing and the white world in which I was educated. And why? 
because I listen to an embarrassing melange of music from many different periods and cultures. My heroes range from Prince to Nelson Mandela, from Edith Wharton to the poet Sonia Sanchez. And my reality is this, I'm an African-American woman, and I'm married to a Romanian Jewish man, and I'm raising a biracial child and a child adopted from Ethiopia in a racially stratified world. My holiday table is occupied by my father-in-law, who is a gay man with a Mexican lover who's 43 years his junior. My brother-in-law is a successful lawyer who has shoulder-length dreadlocks, and he's married to a working-class English woman who never went to college. My sister-in-law is a depressed clinical psychologist who's in the process of divorcing her legally blind Vietnamese husband who was raised by a conservative white Christian missionary. And my father is an atheist who listens to loud gospel music on Sunday. <laughs> I <laughs> like to say that my experience is complicated and diverse and doesn't always conveniently adhere to traditional paradigms. As such, I want to create theater that explores the cultural tensions inherent in being an African American woman living in a multicultural society that is still struggling with the painful legacy of racism and sexism. Sustaining the complexity of what it means to be a female art artist from the African diaspora with a non-traditional narrative. My plays often grapple with issues of identity, using sexuality and the politics of desire to explore the complicated intersections of race and class and power. I enjoy culling history and headlines for the provocative and unexplored stories of women. I toy with popular assumptions about race and gender, and with the hopes of arriving at something that's entirely fresh and giving people a new perspective. <coughs> Diverting expectations is part of my artistic mission. I like to begin with the familiar, then add structural and storytelling ingredients that are surprising and jarring and at times playful and at times painful. A piece of personal history, another piece, uh, in 1989, I had my very first play produced in New York City. It was called Rhinestones and Pace. It was a non-linear offering about a transvestite junkie prostitute dying of AIDS who falls madly in love with um, a radical orthodox Muslim man. To hide their relationship and their illness, the transvestite dresses in Perda, hoping that the cloak of religion will keep her protected from society's condemnation and judgmental eyes. And in my youthful further fervor, I sent this play around to every single theater in New York City, confident that I had created a play that offered a fresh, singular look at lofty themes like religion and AIDS and human sexuality. I was working taboos from all angles, and of course it was summarily rejected by every single person. In fact, I got some hate mail from an agent. <laughs> and of course... <laughs> Um, I, I, um, I continued to move on, and I, a very, very brave friend of mine decided that she was going to produce this play for two performances in a nightclub. The play was packed each night and um, got very, very little notice. I don't think that any press came, and my characters then drifted off into obscurity and have never been seen since. And I decided after that play that um, everything people said about playwriting was true, that it was fruitless and it was impossible and it was a thankless journey. So I sold my computer, took a serious full-time job in human rights, and committed myself to life around the water cooler, which I did for many years. And so early in my career, I abandoned theater and I abandoned art and I began, abandoned writing because I'd allowed myself to begin to leave the propaganda that theater wasn't a vital part of the American dialogue and that the voices of black women were not welcome on the American stage. It was a domain of angry, white, righteous men. But distance made me recognize how important it is for women and for people of color to be part of shaping the cultural narrative. I came to value the role of myself as a storyteller and I came to understand that we need a forum where we can collectively distill our ideas and wrestle with the complexities of the world. And I felt officially wanted those big, hipped, brown-skinned demigods of my childhood to be part of the American mythology. I wanted to place them right smack center stage so that everyone could see them. 
And so after four years of sitting behind the desk, I returned to writing plays. But it wasn't until several years after that that I had what I would say is my epiphanal moment, which I think that a lot of writers had. And it came um, when I took a journey down to Emory College to the Rare Book Library, which um, Emory, um, em Emory's in, in Atlanta. And the school has undergone this, this awesome task of building and maintaining the extensive Bill of Hats collection of early 20th century African American playwrights and writers. If you ever have the chance to go, it's absolutely am amazing. It's an archive of theater memorabilia, letters and yellow scripts littered with the handwritten notes of some of our greatest writers. Many of the pages reveal the writer's private process, a road map of their artistic journey. I spent hours in this library poring over original manuscripts written by writers like Richard Wright and Zora Neale Hurston and August Wilson and Ed Bullen. It was like stripping away layers of paint on a wall to reveal the raw wood with all of its beauty and its imperfection. And it was a reminder that even some of these great writers also struggled and questioned their voices before they, um, they committed their thoughts to the page. It was a very, very humbling experience to be in the company of all these insurgent and defining voices. And as I was preparing to leave the library, the librarian carried over a cardboard box to my table. And she said to me, I thought you might want to see this. And she took out this fragile book from the late 18th century and she carefully peeled back the pages with gloved hands to reveal an original copy of a poem written by Phyllis Wheatley. The crooked typeset was adorned with Wheatley's delicate script notation. The markings were the beginning of my own literary journey in America. The sight of her nascent words overwhelmed me there in front of me was the original copy of the very first book of poetry published by an African in America. And it was the third book of poetry published by a woman in the America. I cried very easily, and I have to say, at that moment, I wept unabashedly. Because you see, 200 years ago, an African slave woman named Phyllis Wheatley felt compelled to put pen to paper and craft poems and from the very moment that she conceived of herself as a poet she had to defend her right to exist she had to defend the right to free expression in a country that believed that a woman an African woman didn't have the intellect nor the creative independence to give birth to an original idea. Yet in this climate, over 200 years ago, Phyllis did something radical. She dared to commit her thoughts to the page and give poetic voice to women in America. It was a bold act. It was a defiant act. It was a political act. A political act. It was an act of self-definition and invention. Truly a ritual that many women today still have to struggle with. So touching Wheatley's words on that page, I found myself suddenly contemplating my own voice, asking myself, what kind of writer do I need to be now? Is my writing an authentic reflection of who I am as a woman, a mother, a daughter, a wife? I ask myself, am I writing honestly? Am I writing Bravely, am I writing for community or self? What responsibility do I have in shaping the larger narrative of women today? I ask myself, why write when people are struggling just to be fed? And when I get lost in these questions, I think of Phyllis Wheatley and the insurmountable obstacles that she overcame to sing herself into existence on the page. And I think of all of the stories left to be told by women from the African diaspora. And it makes me angry that just over 200 years after Wheatley literally fought a legal battle to prove the authentic authenticity of her voice, we as artists 
are still in a battle to be heard. We as the artists are still struggling with governments who refuse to recognize the necessity and the importance of voices of artists in the cultural dialogue. We are told that we are a luxury. We are told that we are something to be enjoyed during times of abundance. But it's in moments like these, moments of austerity, that I argue we need our own artists most. We need the voice of Phyllis Wheatley. And so I, I circle back to the initial question that I wanted to ask is, why theater? Why does art matter? As we know, a culture matures through its evolving maturity and its understanding and defining of self. And so why theater? Theater is visceral and it's urgent. It has immediacy, it lives, it has moments of spontaneity, it can allow you to cry and to have the audience experience those tears. Right now, you don't know where I'm going. You don't know whether I'm going to stand up and abruptly end or whether I'm going to break out into song. And I would sing, but I don't sing very well, so I won't. <laughs> but I will give you a short, oft-quoted poem, a poem that inspires me. And it's a poem that is very, very simple. It's, I swear to you, on this common woman's head, that a common woman is as common as a common loaf of bread and will rise. The economy of words, bare bone ideas like that, speak to the transformative power of writing and of art. Good art allows a shift in perspective, a new understanding of a situation. It isn't static or still. It's not frozen in time. It's in constant motion, movement, action. Something changing, something shifting, a story unfolding, a building toward a climax and a resolution. It takes whatever shape it needs to be in order to tell a complete and compelling story. Good art is never a boring recapitulation of what you already know. It is invention. How do we make theater and how do we make art in times like this? Well, we have the tools right in front of us. A play, a story needs not have a traditional frame. It merely needs to have a compelling narrative and a cast of characters and a director and a publisher who understands how to capitalize on all of those resources. A stage can be anywhere and anything that can support the weight of the ideas. An audience is whoever is willing to enter the world of the playwright and the, the author. This is my stage. You believe I'm a playwright because I am playing that role successfully. If you say that a bridge is a boat and a creative group of artists inhabit it, then the audience will become seasick. The power of theater that needs relatively few tools to be realized. An audience can be seduced through words and action. So you must forgive my hubris. I do feel that what we do is important. I do feel that what we do is, is necessary, particularly at times like this when we and I think of we as a global community are desperately struggling with a more compassionate narrative. A time when reason um, has been hijacked with what I consider to be irrational, loud, narrow-minded voices. It's times like these that we particularly need our artists to be an active part of the public discourse. Now is the time that we should be bolstering our artistic institutions, reinforcing and celebrating our artists. Now is the time to create work that reflects and sustains the complexity of the world and doesn't pander and cater to the status quo. I speak to you writers, I speak to you artists, and I also speak to you art consumers. And I ask that you, in the space of all this adversity, that you continue to create work that is adventurous and poetic and political and perverse and dirty and quirky, and dangerous, and beautiful. And I hope that you continue to hunt for fresh perspectives. It's my hope that you don't allow the financial considerations and the political pressures to t dictate what kind of artist you become. And it's in this spirit that I congratulate the award winners 
of um, the Frank Collie Moore Award because I believe that you're pursuing your passion and just demonstrating on a daily basis why art matters. 